In this video, we're going to go over the Graduate Nursing Student Handbook, and we're going to talk a little bit about the degree plan and some of the policies that are involved in the School of Nursing. You can always find the most recent um, version of the handbook by going to PBA Nursing slash, sorry, pbanursing.org slash grad handbook. So pbanursing.org slash grad handbook. Now, if you see an old version of it, you may need to clear your browser's cache. So you hit control shift delete and you can clear your browsing history. Um, the only thing that you really need to, to um, clear is the cache. So you, you can uncheck everything but cache and you probably want to go everything. Um, and then that'll clear out your cache. Then download it again and your most recent version will appear, which right now is Rev2 for the 2015-2016 handbook. So um, if you click on one of these links, it'll take you directly to that area. Um, accreditation, we've uh, at the moment, the School of Nursing has had our accreditation site visit and we are now waiting for the Board of Governors and the Academic Review Committee to meet and we expect to be um, accredited in October or November of 2016. It will be retroactive to the date of the site visit, which was February 3rd. You can see the School of Nursing mission, you can see the MSN program missions, expected outcomes, all that fun stuff, and then there are links to the catalog. Now, the catalog is a little bit confusing to navigate, so we have given you direct links to the most important links in here, and then below that you can see the DNP program mission goals and expected outcomes, and then links to the um, DNP. There's more of them for the DNP because there are multiple tracks. There is a BSN to DNP track, which is family nurse practitioner. And then there's a postmaster's track, which is also available. So the very, very first thing we need to talk about is the difference between the BSN to DNP track and the postmaster's track. Now, some people may already have a master's degree, say master's in nursing education, uh, master's of leadership, master's of... Um, CNL, so clinical nurse leader. So none of those degrees are actually eligible for the postmaster's track. The postmaster's track is only meant for people who have an advanced practice degree, which is going to be nurse practitioner, nurse midwife, uh, clinical nurse specialist, CNS, or nurse anesthetist. So if you are applying to this program, with a master's degree that is not one of those four advanced practice nursing degrees, then you're not going to be eligible for that postmaster's track. If you want to be a family nurse practitioner, then you're going to need to do the BSN to DNP family nurse practitioner track. So let's go ahead and take a look at the required courses and the sample degree plan. Um, let's just look at the sample degree plan. This takes you directly to the catalog. And what you can see is semester one, nine credits, you're going to do intro to doctor of nursing practice, faith and science, and then epidemiology and genetics, genomics. Semester two will be methods of inquiry of evidence-based practice, healthcare policy and advocacy, and advanced pathophysiology. Now I can tell you one thing that you need to be aware of is that semester two is significantly more difficult than semester one because of advanced patho. Um, our, the, um, the way that our program is structured is you're going to take one nurse practitioner course, what they call the, the APRN core, advanced patho, advanced farm, and advanced health assessment. You're going to take one of those each semester. So that should spread out the difficulty, but please be aware that that course is quite difficult. Semester three, you're going to do Leadership in Organizations and Systems, Advanced Nursing Practicum 1, and Advanced Pharmacotherapy. Now, I just need to mention something about this Advanced Nursing Practicum 1. And all of the nursing practicums, this doesn't matter whether you're in the MSN program or whether you're in the Postmasters DNP or whether you are in the BS and to DNP. The first Advanced Nursing Practicum 1 is a health systems leadership practicum. You are going to um, 
choose your own preceptor. It should preferably be a nurse. Um, in rare exceptions, it could be someone other than a nurse, but generally speaking, it should be a nurse and in a role of leadership. So this could be anything from the director of nursing, the CNO, all the way down to a unit manager, the director of education, um, quality management, risk management, um, infection control, but it needs to be a nurse who's in a position of leadership. It does not have to be at an acute care facility. It can also be at an outpatient facility or a public health, um, but it needs to be some position of leadership. And then what you're going to do is you're going to, number one, follow that person, learn the sorts of things that they do on a normal basis, um, begin to learn what that role entails. And then number two is you are going to assess that practice setting at a systems level. So it's not just how can we improve the care of an individual patient, but how can we improve the system to make the system better for all patients? Maybe it's to make it more um, eff uh, more efficient. Maybe it's to reduce the burnout of nurses. Maybe it's to increase the education of nurses. Maybe it's to provide better education um, for discharge. Whatever it is, it needs to be at a systems level. So in this first practicum, what you're going to do is you're going to learn how to assess that system. You're going to come up with some evidence-based um, um, plans for improvement, and then you're going to explore what would it take to actually implement it? What are the barriers to implementing this? Is it no one has the time? Is that no one cares? Is it that there are uh, policies in place that prevent that sort of thing from happening? Is it that there is a budget issue and there's no money to do that sort of thing? So here you've got this great plan for improvement. What would it take to actually implement it? You don't have to do an implementation in practicum one, but you do need to have that plan in place and figure out what would prevent you from doing it. Then in semester four, you're going to do um, healthcare technology and quality improvement, advanced health assessment and diagnostic reasoning, and then advanced nursing practicum two. Now advanced, advanced nursing practicum two, you're going to build on what you've done in practicum one. You can do it at the same facility, which would make it easier to build, or you can do it at a different facility or same facility with a different preceptor. The key in this one is that in addition to assessing the, the area, coming up with a evidence-based plan for improvement, you're going to actually have to implement whatever that plan is. And this is one of the areas where if you've already done that legwork in practicum one, and now you're just building on it, it's a lot easier because you don't have to recreate the wheel and do all that assessment again, come up with your evidence-based based plan again, figure out what would it take to actually implement the plan. You can just begin implementing the plan. So there's two things here. One is you're going to be, again, following the nurse leader. And the second thing you're going to be doing is you're going to be implementing your plan and then evaluating the outcome. So that is the key to practicum two, is you're going to implement the plan and evaluate the outcome. Now, the MSN program is going to stop right here. The DNP program is going to continue on to the next few semesters. Now, the DNP essentially is a health systems leadership DNP. So when you graduate from it, you'll be a family nurse practitioner, but you will also be a health systems leader. You should be an expert who has the ability to go into any situation, any practice setting, assess the situation, find out some areas for improvement at a systems level, design an evidence-based plan of improvement, carry out that plan and evaluate its effectiveness. That is what the DNP role is. Um, in addition, um, it's also has a, fo a focus on population health as opposed to simply taking care of one patient at a time. So when someone asks, well, why are you going to a DNP program? Why don't you just get your master's program? You tell them, Nurse practitioners specialize in taking care of one patient at a time. The DNP has that ability, but they also specialize in improving systems of care. Now, one of the things I want to mention is that if you are able to listen well and then to be able to put into words what the problem is better than the person who's telling you the problem, 
they will think of you as an expert and then they will want you to solve their problem. And that's what we're after in this particular practicum. All right, so let's talk about the next semester, semester five. Um, at the moment, healthcare economics and finance is actually going to be in semester five and translational evidence-based practice will be moved down to semester six. Um, that will be official in the next catalog and you're not seeing that yet because the next catalog has not gone live yet, but it'll happen probably in June. The reason for that change is that by moving healthcare economics and finance up to semester five, um, students who are in the BSN to DNP degree plan can actually graduate with their master's degree in health systems leadership during semester five. So after semester five, you will graduate with your master's of systems leadership, uh, master's of nursing in health systems leadership. Um, so you're going to do healthcare economics and finance, and then you'll take your very first family nurse practitioner courses, which are management one, acute and chronic health problems, and management one, acute and chronic health problems, clinical. This is essentially a primary, this is a, a primary care adult health course. So what you're looking at is you're looking at um, going to a doctor's office or a nurse practitioner's office that specializes, or at least that sees adult cases. You can see some children and teenagers in this course, but the primary focus of it is adult health. Next, we have the next semester you're going to do um, translational evidence-based research evidence-based practice essentially translational evidence-based practice means how do you interpret research and decide what to do for this patient so there's a p-value of this there is an effect size of this there was a number needed to treat of that here i've got this patient in front of me what do i do with that that is the focus of the translational evidence-based practice and what you'll be doing in this course, in addition, to, it'll be primarily self-driven learning in this one. Um, there will be some online exercises and things like that, but the primary focus is you're going to choose a disease topic. You're going to do a comprehensive literature review. Um, you're probably going to have 30 to 60 articles, and you're going to synthesize that into how do you treat a patient with this problem? How do you diagnose them? What are the differential diagnoses? What are the lab values you should, you should be um, ordering? How do you treat them? What's the first step? What's the second step? What are complicating issues? How do you follow up with that patient long term? So the, that's the focus of translational evidence-based practice. And then you'll be doing management two, which is women, adolescents, and children. Um, as the name implies, you need to be seeing primarily um, children, teenagers, and women. Um, one of, in this particular one, you don't necessarily have to have one site. You might need to have two sites, one for women and one for the teenagers and children. Um, we're going to be looking at some innovative ways of helping people to get this by rotating, uh, perhaps through a pediatric ER. A lot of primary care happens there because, well, uh, you're dealing with colds and broken arms and things like that, not necessarily true emergencies. Semester seven is independent practice management. What we're going to do is we're going to teach you how to um, think about the practice as a business owner or business partner. Um, what is a profit and loss statement? Even if you never own your own practice, having this information is extremely valuable because it will make you, number one, a better employee because you'll be able to know how to think like an owner. And number two, it will help you negotiate a better salary and terms for yourself. And then you're going to take uh, management three, which is complex family health. Semester eight, you only have two courses, Caring for Aging Societies and the APRN Clinical Immersion. This APRN Clinical Immersion is kind of like an, an elective clinical, so you can specialize in an area if you want to. So let's say that for after graduation, you want to specialize in endocrinology and you want to just take care of diabetes patients in the odd uh, Cushing syndrome case. Well, you could do your clinical with an endocrinologist or endocrinology uh, specializing nurse practitioner. And then um, at, during that semester, you're going to have to finalize your scholarly project plan. So all along during these family nurse practitioner courses, 
in each clinical, in addition to taking care of patients, you are also going to be assessing that practice setting at a systems level so that you can be getting ideas for what you want to do for your final scholarly project. Now, some of you are going to want to go back, go back to semester four, and you're going to want to just continue what you are doing for your advanced nursing practicum. However, you've done an entire year and a semester of family nurse practitioner between practicum two and semester nine. So your focus may be very, very different by the time you get there. So that, that, exercise of evaluating each practice setting at a systems level is going to be giving you ideas that you could use for your final scholarly project in addition to what you did for your practicum too. So in this semester, by the end of the semester, you are going to have to finalize your topic and get it approved by the nursing graduate faculty so that when you come to semester nine, all you have to do is work on that scholarly project completion. Now, one other thing is going to happen in semester eight, and that is that we will be providing you with a certification exam prep course. So the uh, American Academy, uh, sorry, the American Association of Nurse Practitioners certification program, AANPCP, allows nurse practitioner students who have completed their nurse practitioner curriculum to take the certifying exam even before they graduate. So you are actually done with your family nurse practitioner program at this point, semester eight, but you won't graduate until semester nine. So what that means is you can actually sit for your certification exam during semester nine. So what we would encourage you to do is having taken that um, certification course, you actually get certified and get take your certification exam in semester nine. That way, the moment you graduate, with your doctor of nursing practice, you have no barriers to licensure. If you wait, so here it is an entire semester since you've done nurse practitioner work, nurse practitioner clinicals, studied, now you're gonna wait an entire semester, then you're gonna graduate, and then you're gonna test for certification, and then you'll be licensed. Skip all that, get your certification exam, early on in semester nine, there's no pressure. There's nothing to worry about now. The moment you graduate, you get licensed. So that is our plan for what you should be doing. All right, so let's go back to the handbook and let's look at some of the policies um, that we have. So we have some general policies. Um, so you can read about some of the general policies as far as health requirements, limitations, um, students with disabilities, progression policies. This is important. Um, if you fail management one or manage or the clinical, for example, you've got to, or if you withdraw from them, let's say that you're just, you, you just can't handle it that semester. It's too much of a workload. You've got to withdraw. You've got to withdraw from both of them. If you fail one of them, you'll get a W in the other one. So basically you have to take them together. If you've already taken um, advanced health assessment, advanced patho and advanced farm, but it's been five years since you took those, we recommend retaking them. If it's been seven years since you took them, then you're going to have to retake them in order to graduate from the BSN to DNP program. So that is the broad overview of the BSN to DNP program. It's also a broad overview of the MSN program. Um, you just would stop after semester four and your degree plan looks slightly different because you're not required to take advanced patho, advanced health assessment and uh, patho farm. Sorry. And, um, yeah, advanced patho, advanced farm, and advanced health assessment. So instead, you take electives, of which we recommend advanced patho, advanced farm, and health assessment. Um, so now we're going to talk about some practice course policies. Now, in our curriculum, we refer to practicum as courses that focus on the integration of systems leadership, evidence-based practice, healthcare technology, and quality improvement. So those very first two courses you take, Practicum 1 and Practicum 2, are focused on health systems leadership, evidence-based practice, healthcare technology, and quality improvement. So if someone asks you the short answer of, what do you, what do, you do in your practicum? You can say, systems leadership and quality improvement. 
and then leaving the evidence-based practice and healthcare technology implied. Um, Cause if you say too much, sometimes people get a little, uh, my eyes are glazing over. When we use the word clinical, we are talking about hands-on patient care advanced practice. So your family nurse practitioner courses are clinicals. Your health systems leadership courses are, are practicum. So try and keep that in mind as we go through because it'll help uh, make things a little more clear. Now, every practice course, which includes your practicum and your clinicals, is 50 hours per credit. So each of them is three credits. Each of them is three credits. So that means it's going to be 150 hours total. In order to do a practicum course, you've got to have a preceptor. You choose your own preceptor because you are going to customize your own education to suit your needs and your desires and your interests. Um, that puts a lot of responsibility on you because it's not up to the school of nursing to get your preceptor. Your preceptor is going to be a guide and a mentor in the practice setting. Um, we have different requirements for different types of practicum and different types of clinical preceptors, and you'll see that a little bit below. You're also going to be responsible for scheduling your own practicum, and that is because we don't know your schedule. All right, so you can read about the requirements in the description for practicum preceptors here. Um, one thing I will mention is earlier I said it should be a nurse, but in some cases you can have someone who's not a nurse. Um, the important thing there is that it has to be very clear, let's say that you're following someone who has a master's of public health but is not a nurse, that you are not practicing as a master of public health, you are practicing as a nurse who is following someone who's a master of public health. So that's the caveat with um, having a non-nurse preceptor. Um, all preceptors must be approved by either the associate dean of nursing for graduate programs or um, the, the practicum course coordinator that the associate dean designates. So even if it is a nurse, it still has to be approved. Um, and then we have clinical preceptors. These are for nurse practitioners. And generally speaking, a nurse practitioner is preferred over a physician. Um, you can have up to 25% of your NP clinical hours with a physician, which basically means 150, which if you only have one practice site each semester means one course. So if you are wanting to do, say, rheumatology for your APRN clinical immersion and you don't know any rheumatology nurse practitioners, so that means you're going to have to do it with a rheumatologist, then all of your other clinicals will have to be with nurse practitioners. Um, you cannot use a PA at all, no physician assistance at all. Um, that's not our rule, that is the um, state law and the certifying body or the crediting body rules. You can use more than one site if one site will not give you enough hours or enough patients or the right mix of patients. So remember, um, for example, in your second clinical course, it's women and children. If you don't have enough fem uh, women patients at a particular um, practice site, you can get a second practice site that will give you more women. And then we have some specific guidance for the first clinical, for the second clinical, and for the third, and for the fourth. So as you go through the, pre the program, go ahead and read those um, guidelines. And then we have some tips for looking for sites. Um, this is extremely important. It's your responsibility. We can help you. We can provide some guidance. Um, if you're not in the first cohort, we'll actually have some preceptors already contracted, but just because they're contracted doesn't mean they're scheduled and doesn't mean that they're going to take you. You have to go out and find your preceptor. You've got to book them. You've got to sell them on you. So first of all, think about nurse practitioners and physicians that you already have relationships with and ask them, Hey, would you mind precepting me or ask them if they would, um, refer you to someone else who could precept you. Think about nurse practitioners or physicians that work in clinics associated with your own health system. A lot of times um, you have connections. Your nurse manager knows someone who knows someone who works in the clinic who might be willing to precept you. You can look in your insurance under find a provider, um, look for a family practice, and you can find people that way. Call them up, call up their office, go visit them bring them some donuts, 
ask them, would you mind be precepting me? Attend the local nurse practitioner council dinners. Um, every county has its own nurse practitioner council. So West uh, Palm Beach County has one, Broward has one, D Miami Dade has one, Martin County has one. Join it. Go to those dinners. Talk with the people at your table. Um, ask them, are you precepting? Do you know people who are precepting? You know, can you refer me to someone who's precepting? Um, another thing is when you have to go to the nurse practitioner conferences, because every fall, um, every October, we make, or we, we make, we require that you attend the nurse practitioner council um, conference. So at that conference, just don't sit with your friends. A group of 10 students at, sitting at a table for a conference does nothing for your education. Split up into groups of two or three and sit with seven other nurse practitioners. Hey, where are you from? What do you practice? Hey, would you mind precepting me? That's how you get preceptors. And then finally, um, look in Metatrax and the list of already approved and contracted sites will be in Metatrax. So you can do that. Now, unfortunately for the first cohort, that didn't work so well because they're actually out there getting those people. But for the second and third cohorts, it'll be a resource that you can use. Now, as far as timing goes, you should be trying to secure your preceptor six months ahead of time. Um, at least six months ahead of time, try and find your preceptor for those clinical, those nurse practitioner clinical pre, uh, courses because they fill up really fast. Okay, so I found a preceptor. What do I do? Well, if the practice site already has a contract, all you have to do is send your completed clinical placement and preceptor agreement form to the graduate coordinator in Metatrax. If the practice site does not have a contract, then you need to send the contact information to the graduate coordinator and then do step one above. If the preceptor works for a large health system that the school of nursing already has a contract with, so say, for example, Delray Medical Center, um, there is a very good chance that there'll be no additional um, contract needed. However, sometimes there does need to be one. Um, so it's always a good idea to ask. You don't want to get caught at the last moment being delayed and you can't start your preceptorship because of that issue. Um, now, even if the student is continuing with the same preceptor, so you say you did um, practicum one, you did with a preceptor, practicum two, you're going to do with the same preceptor, you still have to do a new preceptor agreement form because the preceptor agreement form is specific to that particular course. Um, the site and the preceptor both have to be approved by the graduate faculty. So the um, graduate coordinator, uh, Mr. King, will present your um, preceptors and agreements, sorry, your preceptors and sites to the faculty. And if you don't get approved within one week, then please contact him again. Now we have um, several word documents we call preceptor um, expectation summaries. There's a specific one for each course. You need to provide this um, document to your preceptor at the time you ask. So if you say, hey, I want you to be my preceptor you also give them this page. So it's basically gonna say, Dear Preceptor, if you're reading this, a Palm Beach Atlantic University graduate nursing student is asking you to precept them. In addition to this pre overview, the student should provide you a copy of the syllabus. So you're gonna provide them this page as well as the syllabus. If the preceptor agrees, then they're gonna sign the application form and then the graduate course and coordinator will work with them to make sure the rest of the contract is available. So it's going to describe, this is a systems leadership, quality improvement, evidence-based practice experience. It is the student's first graduate level practicum. The expectations for the students. So it says, here's what the student is supposed to do. Expectation for the preceptor and what they're supposed to do. This is extremely important. We have had a few issues where preceptors don't really understand what they're getting into and they're not having the student do appropriate things. And then mid semester, we figure this out. And now all of a sudden you've wasted half your semester doing things that don't help you get to the end of the course and um, pass the course. So make sure you give this to your preceptor, ask if they have any questions, if they need to talk with the with a, um, the coordinator, if they need to talk with the instructor, then we can arrange for that. But 
what we don't want you to do is get into a situation where you're not being precepted appropriately because your preceptor doesn't really understand what is available. Um, resources available to the preceptor, this is a good one for them to know about. Um, they actually get electronic uh, preceptor manual and they actually get electronic library access as well. So it's kind of a nice little perk for being a preceptor. And I just wanted to point out for the practicum, allow the student to experience all aspects of your role as a nurse leader. If an area is confidential, a briefing may substitute for firsthand experience. This is really important that you're not there as a glorified volunteer. You are there to learn how to be a nurse leader. You are apprenticing to that person. And if you're not being able to practice as a nurse leader in that role, in that setting, then you really shouldn't be there in that setting. At the beginning of every semester, you're required to provide the appropriate documentation that's specified in the contract, and that can include any of these things as well as additional things. Um, as far as immunizations go, for the flu vaccine, you do not re you're not required to get the flu vaccine by the School of Nursing. However, if the site requires you to get the flu vaccine, you're going to have to get the flu vaccine or find a different site. As far as what constitutes a practice hour, everything you do does not actually count toward practice hours. Um, the vast majority of your practice hours need to be completed on site or off-site as directed by your preceptor. So for example, if your preceptor is going to be going to a meeting with a community partnership, you should be going to that meeting with them. That's going to be off-site. Um, if your preceptor gives you a task, okay, there's this group of people you need to meet with at this place, so go meet with them, find out blah, 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 and bring it back to me, then you can do that and it's still considered practice hours. But um, just doing a bunch of research on your own time doesn't really count as practicum hours. Um, a limited number of hours for doing your evidence-based practice, um, that does count, but it needs to be approved ahead of time with your faculty member. So you can't spend 30 hours on, I'm doing research for 30 hours and expect that to count. Um, Certain education oriented activities may count. So for example, if you're, let's say you're doing, um, you're doing your preceptorship um, and there's a conference that relates to that preceptorship, then you can, you can get that approved ahead of time to a certain number of hours. Um, you don't get hours for your travel time going back and forth between the, the site and wherever you live that does not count. Um, as far as IRB approval goes, anytime you're going to be collecting data in a formal manner that's going to be reported outside of the institution, then you need IRB approval. So if you're going to do staff surveys at, at the, uh, at the practice site, so for example, say that, um, you want to know how does your, how does the staff feel that they are able to handle a patient with this particular type of problem? In order to do that survey, you actually need to get IRB approval first. IRB approval is going to be really easy. Um, first of all, PBA has a very easy process in general. And then second, most of the things you're going to be doing are going to be considered exempt anyway, which means that the IRB doesn't actually have to meet in order to approve you. So, um, Make sure you get your IRB approval. Don't get yourself into trouble later on. Um, as far as DNP students go, at the defining thing that a DNP student does is their final DNP scholarly project. So here's a number of policies that relate to that. And if you're beginning in semester one or two, you don't need to worry about these too much, but it does help to keep them in mind as you go along. So here are some key components that a DNP project should do. First one is it focuses on a change that impacts healthcare outcomes, and it can be either direct or indirect care. So it can be directly impacting a patient or it could be improving a system that indirectly affects the patient. It needs to have a systems or population aggregate focus. The focus is not on taking care of patients better one patient at a time. It is at improving a system or improving an entire population of health. 
Second, our third is demonstrate implementation in the appropriate arena or area of practice. It's not enough to plan it. You actually have to do it. There needs to be a plan for sustainability. So what kind of financial systems, uh, what sorts of political realities? It, and it can't just be, well, we could do this and we could do that. It needs to be specific and it needs to be feasible. Fifth, um, include an evaluation process and or outcomes. And those can be formative or summative. Um, DMP projects need to be designed so that the process and outcomes will be evaluated to guide practice and policy. Um, it's really important to have clinical significance. You know, is this a meaningful thing that we're doing? Um, your DNP projects need to be meaningful. And then finally, it needs to provide a foundation for future practice scholarship. Now, it's important and it's helpful, I think, to say some things that are not scholarly reviews, scholarly projects. So, for example, integrated reviews and systematic reviews are a part of your scholarly project, but by themselves, they don't constitute a scholarly project. Portfolios. A portfolio is a way that you document things you've done. It's not a scholarly project. Group and team projects. Um, those are nice and those are helpful, but ultimately your DMP project needs to be something that you are directing and guiding. And then your Practicum 2 project um, is not a scholarly project. It can build into one, but it doesn't have everything you need to become a DNP scholarly project in and of itself. And then finally, you need to disseminate your DNP project. So that can be done in a journal article. It can be done through, um, through scholarly presentations at conferences by poster presentations. And the School of Nursing will actually disseminate your project in an electronic digital repository on pbanursing.org. So, but you still have to take some additional steps yourself. As far as how do you do the DNP project? Well, you're going to have a team. It's going to consist of you, your faculty advisor, and a practice mentor or preceptor. Um, the faculty as a whole, the graduate faculty as a whole, will be evaluating your project, not your advisor and not your mentor. So, um, this should help prevent things that happen with PhD programs where like if the faculty advisor leaves, the student is, has to go find a new mentor and may have to throw away years of actual work. We want to prevent that from happening. We want you to graduate in that one semester time period, um, semester nine. All right, the last thing we're going to talk about are some general policies, a professional web presence. DNP students are going to be required to develop a professional web presence. Um, ideally, that presence would include a website, email list, um, Facebook profile, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Now, for the purposes of our program, um, the website, an email list, and then one other social media venue are going to be what you're going to be required to do. Um, being a healthcare professional is more than just being good at your job and dressing well. It's about controlling your own ability to practice. And the best way to do that is to be able to market yourself directly to potential customers. Um, that's what your professional web presence is all about. So we have tutorials currently online at pbanursing.org. Um, I'll just show you that really quickly and then go to website tutorial. And then there's several different website tutorials. There's one that I did. There's one by Tom Woods and then there's one, another one by John Lee Dumas. Um, the tutorials are how to start a website, how to use WordPress, which is what I recommend you use unless you really know what you're doing. Institutional Review Board, we talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, just make sure that you read all this stuff. Grading scale, you've got to get at least a B, which is defined as an 86, uh, sorry, an 84 or higher in order to progress in the program. Um, and then we have a number of things like make sure you're current with your name and your address and all that nonsense. Um, student email, you got to use your PBA email. Dress code, blah, blah, blah. You got to use APA format. Plagiarism, extremely important. Do not plagiarize. We'll be using Turnitin, which is plagiarism checking software. If you plagiarize, 
then you're going to lose points. If you plagiarize a second time, you may be dismissed from the program. So just be extremely aware of what plagiarism is and don't do it. Um, some additional academic standards and requirements for progression. You've got to get a B in all your courses. Um, professional development guidelines. You can read all that stuff, but basically tardinesses and absences and all that late work, disrespectful behavior, dishonesty, you know, all of those things are not professional behavior and will result in loss of grade and potentially dismissal from the program. Criteria for immediate dismissal, you might want to be familiar with this. Um, basically doing things that are, you know, are not right and lying, dishonesty, academically or clinically are grounds for immediate dismissal. Um, expenses, uh, most of the things that you're going to need in the course, in the program, are already included in your fees. Um, however, there's a few things that are not, and so you want to pay attention to those. Um, as far as review courses go, we hope to be able to provide this through your student fees without having to raise them. We think that we've budgeted in well, but just be aware that there might be an additional fee if you are electing to take your own certification exam. Um, for computer requirements, you've this is an online program, so you've got to be able to use a computer. Um, if you're watching this video, chances are you're probably okay, but here are some requirements you've got there. Um, as far as professional organizations go, you are going to be required to join one as part of your program. And then we also have Sigma Theta Ta International Honor Society, and you are welcome to join that. Um, we strongly recommend that you join these particular things as nurse practitioner students. Library resources, formal complaint policy, these are very important as far as accreditation goes. Accreditation wants to know that you have know how to file formal complaints if you need them. So there's two different ones, one for academic complaint, I don't like my grade, and one for non-academic complaint, um, which is usually unethical behavior. Other campus contacts, use of social media, um, really important that you adhere to HIPAA and FERPA guidelines. Uh, FERPA is the educational version of HIPAA. Um, and then there's a bunch of different forms. So that is pretty much it. You've got in a quick little 45 minute briefing, everything, well, not everything, but lots of things that you need to know about the program and about the schedule and about how things work. If you have questions, please do not hesitate to contact either me, Dr. Morgan, or Mr. King, and we'd be happy to help you in any way that we can.